Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. It is 11 o'clock Central Texas time and welcome back to The Pulse. It is Freedom Friday and of course, it couldn't be another Friday without a Stephen Friday. Stephen Staggs is back. Steve Staggs is back and you know, this is a, it's neat when something becomes kind of um, a routine because you look forward to it. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm looking forward to this discussion. You know, Steve and I were just talking in the green room about kind of feedback from all of you. And it's been really fun because, you know, not everybody is like into this, you know, they're like, well, it may not be the right time for me to hear this message, but I'm excited that we're actually documenting this and recording it. And it, it's just really neat though. Those of you who are kind of interested in this conversation, this is unusual. It's unusual because it's a lot of times, you know, a guy like Steve and I would talk privately and it's not very often that you got a channel. You can say, Hey, I want to, I want to bring this out into the open and say, hey, let's have this discussion. Because one of the things that's so cool about, you know, getting to know the creator of the universe is the fact that nothing surprises him, right? We're always thinking that we can hide something from him. Doesn't that sound like the original garden, right? We're like, we, we, were, we were afraid of you. It's like, like as if God didn't know where they were. Where were you? Where are you? And it's, it's so common with us. And so I feel like this is so refreshing for me. And of course, you, you know that I'm extremely curious. I'm curious about how is everything created? How does all, this all work? And to, to give anyone who hasn't been a part of the last five episodes, we've done this. This is our sixth week in a row that we've done this with Steve Staggs. I want to give you a, a sense of this. So I, uh, Brandon, if it wasn't for Brandon coming into town, he came into town uh, for the Texan meetups. He wanted to do a tour of all of Texas. He and X-Ray Vision came in with their Winnebago, and they literally traveled around. And the TNM um, hosted with us these meetups at different places. And we were like at a bar and grill in Dallas. And I invited a guy, Carter, because he had just reached out to me um, like the day before. I'm like, hey, well, we're going to be up in Dallas if you want to come by. And he didn't say anything about this guy, Steve, but he brought this guy, Steve, with him. And as soon as I met him, of course, I got to meet him and re recognize uh, something amazing. But I literally heard his voice and the Lord said to me, listen to this guy. I'm like, OK, all right. And I jokingly said, I'm like, is he an angel? And what's so funny about that is he has been a figurative angel for me in the sense that it has been so eye opening. And it's amazing to, to shine a light on really the past 40 years of Steve's experience and to say, wow. And, and I'm just getting like, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface, but what he's representing is what we're all doing, right? We're all seeking to find and understand our place in this world and how we were created and what is ultimately, you know, the design of all this. What is it meant to be? How is it supposed to be? And that's what this, this theme of this is all about, right side up. And this is really straight out of Steve's uh, writing and his, his mouth. He's like, everything's upside down. It's like, well, wh what if we were to make it right side up? Let's, let's, let's put some effort into doing that. But a lot of times in order to put something right side up, you have to identify that it's upside down. And so that's what Steve's helped me do is help me understand, hey, stuff's upside down. And that is true. But Steve Staggs, if you don't know, one of the coolest stories about him is he was a professional baseball player. And what's so cool about it is the one thing I know about like professional anything is there's so many boys who want to play baseball. It's one in a million that you can even go to the, the big leagues. But then to be there for several years and have the experience that he had is really cool because that was his early days. And ever since then, God has got a hold of his heart and has directed him. And I truly believe that what he has done for me is... He has showed me what the true gospel is, the true gospel, the purity of it, the simplicity of it, the beauty of it. And so that is it's just so refreshing. It's so amazing. And so let's bring back to the pulse for episode six, my buddy Steve Staggs. What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? Well, welcome back. There's six weeks in a row. I don't know if I've ever done anything this consistent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first for everything. That's right. That's right, man. Well, this is so great. So, Steve, you're um, um, you're a lot of things, right? But one thing is you're a granddad, aren't you? What do they call you? Papa. 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 So tell us about, I mean, 
it, you're you've got an amazing family and all that stuff. To give folks a little bit of background on you, just real high level. Who is Steve Staggs besides Papa? Um, I'm a guy you you shared with it that wanted to um, wanted to play baseball. Um, got older, wanted to know who Jesus was. Uh, got older, was invited by him to, you know, to hang with him and do the stuff he's doing with him. Said, yes, let's do that. That that did not include baseball. So there was an exit there. Uh, met my beautiful wife at a uh, at a baseball game. One of those eye contacts really? kinds of things. Yes. And it's like, OK, that's it. You're done. And here <laughs> we are. 48, 49 years later and still wow. still hanging out. Um, I have two children, um, wonderful daughter, Story, and uh, equally wonderful son, Todd. Uh, they're both married, both have two children. Um, Todd has uh, his oldest grandson is Logan. He's my buddy. <laughs> uh, we call, he calls me every now and then. And, you know, it's pretty special when a, 22 year old calls you on the phone and says, Hey, let's just talk for a couple hours. Wow. That's, that's not an everyday thing. Um, then there's, uh, there's Maya, his daughter, she's going to school in New York, incredibly bright young woman, purest heart in the world. So she's a, she's a real joy. Uh, and then my daughter story has um, her husband is named, uh, Richard, they have two children, Reese and Ruby. Reese is 12. Wow. Ruby's uh, going to be 10 in July, and they're a joy. And um, to me, the the family is is the greatest thing of all. Mm. Uh, we're going to go see, uh, planning to go see Todd and Ashton, his beautiful wife in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, in a couple of uh, maybe three or four weeks. So we're really looking forward to that. So uh, to us, the the eternal treasures are are with family. That's where, you know, what we do day to day kind of comes and goes. But the thing that is lasting, um, that spans generations is our, our family and children. And so God has really blessed us with a fabulous family. So appreciate you asking about that. Yeah, well, it's cool. And I love names. I love names. Reese and Ruby. Yeah. I love it. Oh, my gosh. That's so great. And then tell us that story again. So what was the baseball game where you met, you saw your wife, you locked eyes with her? Tell us that story because that, that sounds like a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, baseball players are known, profession, especially at the professional ranks, as being kind of wild, wild guys. You know, we. I saw you. I saw yeah, your picture. We're, we're a little wild, you know, at the at the core, and um, so it's not unusual that you have gals that come to come to the games, and they may not be great baseball players, but they're you know they're interested. They're not baseball fans, but they're interested yeah. in baseball players. Right. Right. So I don't know if that was her case or you know case or not, but she came uh, to the game with a with her friend. Um, her friend was dating uh, our catcher Craig Perkins. <laughs> um, I came off the field, looked up in the stands. She, her dad had purchased tickets that were right up above our dugout. I looked at her, and literally one of those eye locking moments. Wow. And I came in the um, came in the dugout, and I said to Craig, "I said, Craig, who's that with uh, with Sue?" And he said, "Well, she's I don't really know her. She's a girlfriend that I think she just moved here from Virginia or someplace. I don't know." I said, "Well, listen, would you uh, would you ask Sue if she'd be willing to uh, set us up so that we can maybe have dinner together sometime? I'd like to I'd like to meet her." Mm -hmm. And um, so a couple of days later, we did, and here we are. The rest is you know, that was that was in May night. That was in May nineteen eighty four. Wow! So forty nine years ago, and we were married in um, 
in August of 75 when I played in Omaha for the Omaha Royals at the AAA level. Okay, so you're saying you met her at what year? 1974. Okay, 1974. Okay, you said 84. I was like, that's... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. 74, yeah. yes. Wow. Yeah, 19, thank you for the catch. Well, you know, the unfortunate part is I was born in 1973, Steve, so I probably... <laughs> And everybody calls me the old man. <laughs> well, well, Steve, I just love those stories too, because if you think about this, you know, we're talking about God and his, you know, there's some mystery to all of this stuff. And of course, there's no more greater mystery than love yeah. and in relationships and all that. And it's so amazing to see that, you know, I don't think in our culture today where we're so fixed on science and like figuring everything out and we're the smart ones. But when you describe that that moment, and it's you know something in that moment, don't you? Yeah. When you see that, you know something in that moment. And I would say these are part and parcel of the same things. Like what we're talking about on these series of things is literally us recognizing that not everything is our own creation. Yeah. Right. We are a part of this thing, but it's like this path. Well, look at the legacy. Right. You just described who your kids are and their kids are. And you make this point about family. Somebody said to me one time, they said, you know, if you think of an apple seed or, you know, the seed of some fruit in the orchard. Right. What started there in 1974 has created an orchard. And of course, you mentioned even, you know, your son reaching out to you and saying, hey, let's talk for or whatever, you know, whoever, you know, it's this legacy and the richness of this. And I think a lot of people. I got woven in or, or yeah, I, I was woven into a family like you described, Steve, my mm -hmm. father-in-law, I would say you and he would get along really well, but there's a certain faithfulness and it, it, we joked about it. I think last time it's kind of like Daisy chaining good decisions together yeah. and it's, yeah. there's a real benefit to it. Right. Yeah. Yes. You know, and it sounds like that's one of the things that, what is the fruit of the spirit? What is the fruit of saying, Hey, I'm going to follow you. Jesus is, it, it has so much impact beyond just the, the like what's right in front of you. Can you talk about that idea, this idea that as you continue, because we, we certainly don't do it perfectly and we certainly are being conformed into his likeness, but what's the fruit of this faithfulness to listening to him and walking with him? Cause you, you, you got these byproducts of it, right? You got this family mm -hmm. and that's going to impact so many other things that you have no control over, but it's, it's the work of God in your life. And I think a lot of people are looking, it's like a lot of younger people are like, I don't even, I've never locked eyes with her before, you know, like w that's a beginning of something. Can you talk about what's, what's the byproduct of that faithfulness? Well, yeah. Wow. There's, there's a ton in, in that question. Um, First of all, one of uh, Jesus is famous in, in my relationship with him for giving little snippets of statements that, you know, when you when you hear him at first, you go, oh, that's kind of interesting until it catch it hits you what it actually means. And one of those, you you mentioned the 60s white paper, you know, yeah. last week, and it opens with this little statement at the top, decisions are the are the seeds of reality's harvest. We say it again. Decisions okay. are the seeds of reality's harvest. Oh wow, what a great example! Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, that's one of that's one of those you know statements where yep. I'm just walking down the road one day and he says, "Hey, did you know that decisions are the seeds of reality's harvest?" <clears throat> yeah, that'll you know, hit you inside the head. Pow! Whoa, what 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 does that mean? Well. A decision, every time you make a decision, that decision is like planting a seed. And that seed will produce your reality. So what does that say about the importance of decisions? So if you like the way your life is running, then keep making the same kinds of decisions. If you think there's some holes in the way that you're living or things aren't really going the way they need to go, then hey, stop and think about the, the basis for which you are making your decisions. Um, well, that was a profound concept to me. Um, and then you add this thing. So now how do I make decisions? Well, 
you're entering the word faithful. Okay, so what is it to be faithful? Well, in the upside down world, we interpret faithful as being almost loyal. Yeah, yeah, true. There's a loyalty element to it. Well, that's not what faithful is in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, faithful is being full of faith. It is, it is literally what it says. Okay, so what is faith? We talked about faith, you know, before in the, a couple of the other streams, that faith is, is this atomic power, if you will, that is resident in whatever it is that Jesus speaks. So when he speaks to you and he says, good and faithful servant, in some of the examples of the parables you were you know, mentioning earlier yep. in, in the green room, is that, okay, then a faithful servant is one who is full of his faith. And what is what he is full of is that atomic power inside of what he says. That servant is full of what Jesus is saying to him. Yeah. And so then when he speaks in the in the form of his decisions, then the atomic power, if you will, of faith is in that decision that then produces the outcome of what Jesus is having you speak or decide. OMG, you just yeah. described yeah. Lord, how you created. Yeah. You spoke. What was resident in your speaking was the Father's faith that, by the way, is as if it were the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you could command the mountain to be moved, picked up and moved from here to there, and, and it would obey you. Whoa. Yeah. So the Father spoke to you. You spoke then into the, you know, into the whatever it was that was there. The result of that was the creation that we call the creation, documented in Genesis 1 through, you know, 1 and 2. And oh my goodness, you do the same thing to me. When wow. you speak to me, you send that same atomic power so that when I when I speak and decide what is happening out of that choice and decision is to create the next thing that Jesus wants to create. Wow. And that becomes the harvest of our life. Whoa. Wow. We didn't plan that, Steve. <laughs> Maybe you did. I didn't. Oh my gosh. That is so good. Well, okay. So let me say it back to you because this is really profound. You know, what's interesting is I often hear people talk who are not talking in the vernacular of the church, right? And these are people created by God, right? They live and breathe in people and they'll talk about manifestation, right? You hear a lot of people, especially in crypto, you hear this a lot, but you know, what's interesting about it is it, I often talk about how, you know, science is like this ladder and, you know, reality, which I would say is the creation, which is in our context, it's literally everything, right? God made it what all. Is. What is? Good point. And it, basically, they're leading to the same place. Me, and I don't mean leading to the same place from a churchy perspective. I mean, they're, they're, I guess the term is part and parcel of the same thing, which you're coming to it and recognizing a portion of creation and how it works but from a, an interesting perspective. In some cases, there's a lie associated with those things, but we're identifying things that are real. So for example, I think a lot of people that are in the kind of new agey movement would say, yeah, you've got all the power. You are, um, you are the divine and you are, um, you know, speaking things into existence. You're manifesting those things. So if you want more money, you know, think about more money. And if you're really specific and you write it down and you talk about it a bunch of times, well, what's, what I find odd about this is in some respects, it's, it's not that you're seeing it differently. You're just wrecking it. You're, you're, you may not have the understanding of where that true power resides because you're assuming that that is all resident just in you. But I almost feel like over these six, six you know, five weeks of discussion, is I, I feel like there's a lot of stories that Jesus told 
that give us an indication how if we're not connected to the source. And I know that in the first episode, you talked about the roots and what the roots draw. Yeah. And the question is, what are your roots drawing from? And this idea that, okay, I have, um, it's, you even said this before, you said you, you've kind of forgotten who you are. Well, I almost feel like we get glimpses of it and we try to put labels on it to say, well, yeah, I'm going to manifest this stuff. Well, a lot of times what we're manifesting is, you know, the creation, not the creator. Yeah. We're not seeking to understand the source. We're trying to magically appear the creation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the miracle concept of instantaneous reconfiguration of something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this is, this is so interesting. So I, I put up that banner because I didn't want to miss it myself, right? I wanted to make sure it was in there. Is this correct? Decisions are the seeds of reality's harvest? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. So to break that down then, so every choice that we make, and, and a lot of times, Steve, I would say choices don't seem like they're super consequential. No. Right. We've talked about this before, like, hey, what pair of shoes am I going to put on? What jacket today? You know, am, am I going to go to this place for lunch? And, you know, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? And then you think about what you're saying is you may not see this decision that you're making having a tremendous impact in the future. But as you add these things together, and I, I think I saw this with my dad, is that, you know, when he came out of surgery, he said, don't smoke. <laughs> You know, he's just gotten his lung cut out, basically. And he's like, don't smoke. And I'm like, well, that, that's a little late for that one, right? But he's he's basically saying, I made these decisions and I repeated these decisions over time and it led to this spot. And I know that's just kind of a weird example of it. But, you know, one of the things it says in, in the word is it talks about holding each thought captive. Well, that really is interesting. Like if you were to listen to Jesus and say, all right, I'm not going to do anything unless you tell me to do it. And you know that it has that atomic energy. Well, what if we could continue making those decisions, Steve? There's, there's, it builds up, it seems like, right? There's an aggregation of that, which has a, a longer term blessing. And I think in the short term, it seems like when we make those decisions that are according to what, you know, he's speaking there's like peace around it. Everyone else is benefiting from it. There's like a resonance to it versus when I'm going my own way and making my own decisions. I, I, it's like I may win, but everyone else doesn't. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Well, the I, I don't know if I'm I'm going to be answering um, answering your question, but and so bring me back to it if I'm if I'm yeah missing. yeah yeah. Your question is that um, we don't think that much about the importance of our of our decisions because they become routine to us. Yeah, yeah. And yet Jesus says, ask this or makes this really controversial statement that. Preachers, teachers, and, you know, learned people inside the church have not been able to get a handle on, which is, um, consequently, you will be judged for every idle word that you speak. Yeah. Well, what in the, what in the world is he talking about? Is he some... Are you making me paranoid about everything that comes out of my mouth? Yeah. You know, what, how do I know what's idle and what's not idle? What, what the heck do you mean by that? <laughs> you, you know, right. which we don't ask. Right. The, but you we're can. Taught, we're taught to go in there and try to figure out, you know, through study and something else, what Jesus is recorded to have said, instead of just stepping back and saying, whoa, dude, what did you mean by that? That seems pretty heavy handed to me. What is wrapped up inside that is an understanding of, the nature of decisions. The, you know, you were talking about the new agey thing just a minute ago. Um, well, okay, you can speak whatever you want to speak. And yes, you will have some effect in creating something yeah. out of your decisions. The question is one, who is the source of that 
speaking, two, whose interests does it serve, and three, and most importantly, is it eternal or is it temporal? And here's the point, whatever is temporal, whatever will pass away is idle. It didn't, doesn't mean it didn't occupy some, some period of time on the planet. It doesn't mean that it didn't have some impact on the planet. It just means that it passed away. Yeah. Well, in the context of eternity, that's as if it never existed. Right. I mean, Whoa. So Jesus says, hey, heaven and earth will pass away. Whoa, what does that mean? But my word will never pass away. Hmm. Whoa. So, Steve, what is it that you want to be held accountable for when this whole thing is wrapped up? Do you want to be accountable for the stuff that passes away or do you want to be accountable for the stuff that is eternal, that lasts forever. What? Where is your interest, Steve? What do you want to do? You're free to choose. You can do whatever you want to do. Wow. But what is it that you would like to have, you know, you know, plant your flag in? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus, I think the stuff that actually means something, then okay, if that's what you want to do, then listen to me, learn to listen to me, learn how to make decisions with me, and when you do, I will fill you with my faith. And when you speak and decide, then we will create together what our Father has intended from the beginning. Steve, is that something you're interested in? Well, Lord, okay, let's do that. <laughs> this is the ultimate Jesus dropping the mic. He's like dropping the mic. He's like, that's it, folks. And how, how one of the things we joke and not joke about what we laugh about and we enjoy so much is the simplicity yeah. of, of this. It's like once you recognize that things are upside down and once they're right side up, they're actually really, really simple concepts. What's so striking to me is the fact that this is new to me. Hmm. And that's yeah. the shocking thing, right? Yes. And so anyone yeah. that's listening to this is the shocking thing is. I've gotten a sense of this. I, I jokingly said in our first episode that, you know, it's one thing to smell a good brisket and it's another thing to eat a good brisket. Yeah, right on. And I almost feel like I've smelled what he's cooking and it smells so good, right? I've smelled. I don't know that I've tasted. At, at times, maybe he's broken yeah. off a piece for me. And But there's something different here, which is this idea of, I really truly believe, Steve, that there's so many people and that the devil's work is, is essentially the ultimate middleman wanting to get in between us listening to his voice. Yeah. And it really feels like well, if life and peace and all of this fruit is from basically there's a weird, and, and maybe you can speak to this. The only term I know in English that makes any sense is this kind of idea of letting go or surrendering to his authority, which actually increases your authority, but you realize that I'm more of a pass through of him than I am just a separate, you know, thing. And so as I get connected and I draw from this, there's almost joy. It's like, I think about my son, he just turned 12 and you know how this is, you know, you know that a 12 year old is not a 25 year old. Yeah. But when he makes some progress or he, he's getting funnier by the day. And so his humor is becoming more, more adult like, and it's hilarious. And I'm like, I kind of look at him like, wow, you're actually getting some kind of complex, you know, jokes. Like his jokes before were really bad. I'm like, that was pretty, that's pretty good. And, and I'm proud of him, but I, I'm proud of him in context. Like it's okay. I don't expect him to be 25 or 55. I don't expect him to know everything, but I take joy in the growth. Do you believe, I believe it, I'm sure you do, that God takes joy in our progress? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the hard things. Um, at least it was for me, you know, as, as Jesus was transitioning me from the, you know, from the, 
from the religious world that I was a part of in, into his kingdom and the way that that is functioning and how it operates and the whole attitude, you know, inside, inside the religious world, it is all based on law because the intention of it in, is to subjugate God's man to something. Right. It has to be subjugated to some thing, T-H-I-N-G. When in reality, he was only he was always designed to be a partner with God. Now, from a relational and positional, uh, what I refer to as standing, from a position of standing, those are light years apart. Our standing to law, which is subject, in other words, subservient to it, as opposed to, in, and in contrast to, our standing with Jesus as a partner. Hmm. Those are light years, light years apart. And so what happens is that what you do, when you discover the difference between the two is that the law model is there, to, is there for the purpose of pass-fail. Right. The only thing is you never really know what, what the law means until you come under somebody else's opinion about it. And then you're subject to not the law itself, but their opinion about that law. A judgment. See? Ah. Whereas the model inside the kingdom is one rooted in, in attitude. So in, in the model of law, it's pass fail. You either screw up or you get it right. In the, in the model of the kingdom, it's no, it's the attitude. I want to learn how to live with you, Jesus. Well, okay, let's do that. Oh, you screwed up? Oh, no worries. Let me show you how, how let me make you better out of that screw up. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how it actually worked. Let me unpack for you what was happening behind the scenes that you couldn't see so that next time you can see. An entirely different model. They're not even in the same universe. They are so totally different. So yeah, the father gets a, has a great time watching us even in our failures because guess what comes out of our failure? A greater learning and understanding of who he is, why he is, and how things work with him. Yeah. Well. Wow. That, I like that model. I do too. Well, and it, it's, it's also reflected in the story you told, you know, your papa, right? Yeah. I mean, I think about, you know, I don't have grandkids. I'm looking forward to that. I really am. And You'll love I, it. I, I just imagine seeing these little ones and they don't know all this stuff, right? No. They don't know what papa's been involved in and, and all this stuff, but you enjoy them and you you take joy in their development and you, you know, you give to them and you, but they also are a, a production of the joy. And I, I, one of the things I see with my, my kids, and I'm sure with grandkids, this is probably even more concentrated is almost this purity of love because you get to see them on occasion, right? Like you don't see all of the stuff but you get to enjoy, it's almost like tasting the fruit of these decisions that have created this reality for you. And I think of a lot of people that watch this, and I certainly find this to be the case is, you know, what are we called to? And to think that if I had a choice and I, I think about my dad a lot, you know, he made choices and you kind of, a lot of times have to live with the ramifications of choices. I mean, you cut your arm off, you're not going to have an arm for the rest of the life. But there's also, so there are some consequences to the decisions we make, but also I almost feel like we need to testify to the hope that is in daisy chaining good decisions together. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's like spurring you on to love and good deeds. And, and I think in crypto, what I'm trying to do with all this and what I'm just so thankful for is the fact that, you know, a, a good encouraging word to people of providing them with hope that there is a future that's better. Partly we're speaking it into existence. And on the other hand, we're also, um, we're providing people with, with hope and encouragement. And 
I don't know. There's just a, it seems like if you had a choice, would you be a creator or a critic? It seems yeah. pretty obvious to me that you'd be a creator. Yeah. And and to think about those words that come out of your mouth and what they create. Yeah. You know, I think about, you know what, you know what I was told all my life? And I, I hate, even hate to say this because it's embarrassing for my family. You cannot be trusted. Yeah. I, heard, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard that. And I'm like, no, I can be trusted, you know? And I'm like, well, does that define who you are? And I think about a lot of people who have had parents and, you know, been in relationships or situations where they've been told a story and they're like, well, I guess that's who I am. The amazing thing about what you're talking about is that everything in the scripture is about Jesus giving you a new name and says all of the, that stuff, right? All of that carnage and all of those stories, I'm going to redefine who you are in me. Yes. How, and that is, I think that's the thing, you know, people that are cursory kind of coming to, coming to Jesus, right? And going, well, I've heard about this Jesus guy. And yeah, I know they changed the calendar, but, you know, is he really who he says he is? And what I love about everything that we've done here in these last five weeks is I, these things pop out in my mind of the things you said. Like one of those is, yeah, I went down front and the pastor said to me, hey, you want to, I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. And I'm like, that's so perfect. Do you realize that one statement by him, what it created for you, Steve, in your life? Yeah. And he spoke that into you and you're like, I took him seriously. He was going to introduce me to this guy. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> and then here you are. Look at your whole life story of your journey with Jesus is, getting to know him. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to tell you folks, there is a real person to get to know. Yeah. And there is real power and there's real speaking. And it's one of these things where I love the subtlety of it because in a way, if it was loud, um, we wouldn't cherish it. Yeah. You know, and it's, and then there's so many stories. It like makes the scriptures become technicolor. A man finds a treasure in a field. Yeah. Well, yeah, he find, he's like, I found a treasure. No one else found this treasure. I found this treasure. I'm going to go buy the entire field. Yeah. So I have that treasure. Well, what is that treasure? That is Jesus. That's what we're testifying to. That's what we're saying. Is yeah. that guys, there's a treasure here. Well, what is a treasure? It has value. What I'm saying is I'm not trying you to, to join my church or join my religion or do this stuff. I'm saying, and that's why I often talk about it. I found out where the food is. I found the treasure. Yeah. And the treasure has value, but it's not the kind of value you think. Yeah. It's the value you actually need. Yes. 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 So well, it's, you know, to your very point, uh, Matt, um, words, decision, things that we're talking about. And this has become very, you know, you know, in our relationship and now folks are getting a chance to be exposed to that, you know, through our, uh, our broadcast here of our typical telephone conversation is over time, you become increasingly aware because it becomes obvious of how upside down we are in our, in our thinking. So you just said a few minutes ago, by way of example, I love it how Jesus then comes in and says, I'm going to redefine you. No, we have already been redefined. He's stripping away the redefinition and bringing us into our original definition of who we are in him that he established and created before time began. We are the redefinition when we operate in the upside down world. Okay. So that, that's the corrosion. That's the, the gunk. That's the stuff that he has to remove. Yes. That's the redefinition. So, the so way but the, you describe it, the way you describe it is um, you're just not an accident. You're yeah. just not come out of the ooze. You're not just an animal. You're right. That's right. the redefinition. And Jesus says, no, no, I'm going to strip away the redefinition. And when I strip away the redefinition, I'm going to strip away everything that supports and establishes in you an attitude that says, yes, I'm just ooze. Yeah. 
10 million years down the road. Yeah. No, you're not ooze 10 million years down the road. That's the redefinition. Yeah. We're going to strip that away. It's kind of like we were talking about, you know, the, the citizens, you know, deserving, you know, a vote. No, citizens don't deserve votes. Yep. Yep. They and demand the it. deserve votes. Citizens demand votes. Why? Because they're superior. Well, okay. So let me ask you this question. <laughs> There's a, now we go back to a previous discussion we had and we, we you, you even reflected this within the scriptures is then there is a convention for the effect that God uses of renaming people. Right. And we see this. So I want to, I want to hold both things up in kind of tension to say, you were created perfectly. You were created in who you are. You may just get becoming to know who I made you to be, right? Yes. You, 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 yeah. You've forgotten who you are, right? Yes. But in some cases, even Jesus himself, and in many cases, they use the convention of renaming to illustrate that point. Yes. Is that fair? Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, um, Jacob to Israel, um, you know, Jehovah Saul to Paul. Yeah, Saul to Paul. Yes, a lot of examples like that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say hello to some folks here, and then I've got something special for you, Steve. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) We're having fun. Yeah, we are. I'm, I had no idea it was going there, and I'm so happy it went there. Taryn, great day, all. I've been waiting for this episode by watching all the others again, mind-blowing every time. Taryn, thanks for, for sharing that. It really is an encouragement to us. MT Corner, good day to you. Thanks for being here. Crypto, Compassion Friday, blessings to everyone. Bearded Saint. So here's what's cool. So Bearded Saint, I met him in the in the old bull market and he came about and he what a wonderful person but he had this he was bearded he had this big old beard and when i first got to know him this is for, before my dad passed i was like dude you remind me of my dad of what he was like when he was young and so he and i've developed kind of a, a cool relationship um i hope you're doing well bearded saint it's so great to have you here um and just hope the greatest things for you i hope this is a blessing to you as well but you're an indication that springtime is coming. Many people, Steve, have have kind of in the bear market went away because they're like, I just got to get, I can't be just hopeful all the time. I got to get to work. Yeah. And now they're back because they see things are shifting and changing and we're about to launch a pulse chain. And, you know, V4 just came out and people are excited. And so Bearded Saint, you are, you are my groundhog today. Thank you for being here, man, and popping your head up. Uh, Michael Ostell, bust my brain. I'm loving the white paper. Fantastic, Michael. And it's really for, you know, Michael, that's a neat story. So Michael is what I what has been called the mystery man. Mm-hmm. And a funny, funny, wonderful story. Um, Sam Kemp, who is 78, and he is probably one of the greatest promoters of the Texan token. He's a volunteer with the uh, Texas Nationalist Movement. His buddy, Michael, this is him. He's like, mm. hey, man, I've been in crypto for a long time. And he had talked to us. So ch- check out how God works. This is like an illustration of it from Michael. So <laughs> so we are working with the, the TNM. And Michael, for years, had been talking to his buddy, Sam. Hey, mm. Sam, you ought to consider it. And Sam's like, ah, crypto. That's crypto schmipto. <laughs> and then he's volunteering for the TNM. And they're like, Hey, there's this TNM thing. They're creating this thing called Texan token with this group, you know, these crypto bros. And he calls his buddy and goes, Hey, have you heard of Texan token? And Michael says, No, but if that crypto heartbeat's involved, you ought to pay attention. And I'm like, <laughs> What are the chances? Yeah, right on. <laughs> what are the chances of that happening? So, Michael, thanks for being here. And he is the one that has been so blessed by what you've shared. And the white paper as well. So I just want to say shout out to Michael. Thank you so much for that. Um, It's just more evidence, right? That we did not orchestrate this. Um, And then there's David Lee all the way from Southwestern Indiana. The guy that loved me through my dad's funeral and every day since, and is always here. Um, And he's, 
he, you know, he is journeying through stage four colon cancer with his wife. Yeah. And you know what? And, and, and there have been miraculous things, Steve, that have happened in all of that. And, you know, this, we, he and I talk on a regular occasion about the things that I'm, you know, that you've helped me understand. And what, it, what it's really doing is it's purifying this direct connect to Jesus yeah. himself. And what I keep saying to him is the stuff you keep saying to me, he's alive and he speaks. <laughs> I'm like, he's alive and he speaks. And he's like, well, well, let's just listen to him. Yeah. And how cool is that? So there's, there's real, there's real benefit there and, and encouragement to you. Sandy B, the dude's here. Good morning, all. Thanks for being here, Sandy B. Friday blessing. Vinny three. Hello, all. Um, Ari, Ari is the thriller in Manila. He's in, he's in the Philippines in Manila up, up late, up very yeah. late listening to this. So thanks for being here, Ari. He's a part of the Ophir crypto community and just, there's so many people that love the Lord in the Philippines. It yeah. is amazing. That team is amazing. Um, Sandy B poor rags. He got two strikes in a span of 15 minutes yesterday. Well, you're not supposed to live stream CNN. That's why we get in trouble. Jack Handy, hello, friends. Um, a stub my crypto. Everything that's right is wrong, and everything that's wrong is right. It is upside down. There's no question about it. Heck excited is here. Missed the stags. Yes, absolutely. Um, was made yesterday. YouTube got, yeah. <laughs> upside down is an understatement. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not sure who Roy Hobbs is, but that's probably some reference for someone. Oh, is fastball, it, the like button, it, please. Isn't Roy Hobbs the, uh, what was it, with, um, he was the left hand, what was the name of that uh, movie with? Um, oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, the, the Natural? The Natural, there you go. Yeah, wasn't that Roy Hobbs? Yeah, Roy Hobbs, baseball. Um, yeah, The Natural. Yeah, the novel, yes. The Natural, yeah. 1952, Bernard uh, Molmud. Uh, the natural what a great movie that was yeah. yeah when he hits that ball and the music and the lights go <laughs> right. it gives me chills just talking about it Whew. isn't it amazing that a game like that is so like iconic for our yeah. you know it's like a metaphor for everything he is roy hobbs that's correct i stubbed my crypto <laughs> fastball the like button awesome um um oh Terrence said, I fell asleep last night thinking about that mustard seed. Wow. wow. Rich liberation. Uh, Drew Davis. Some reason I decided to watch today, feeling convicted of my decisions and the lack of God's input in my decisions. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Drew, thanks for sharing that. Most people yeah. wouldn't come into the chat with that. So I, I really appreciate you, you doing that. Um, surrender is essential. Um, perhaps I'm not yet able to hear him because of my decisions. You know what? I, let's address this one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna channel my best Steve Staggs here for a second, and then you can correct me. I got backup. Um, it's it's really interesting. You said early on, you said you know, do babies actually um, understand English when they come into the world? Nope, they don't. They look into the eyes of their parents. And as you said to me, and I think it's such a great analogy, is like ask the father to teach you how to hear him. And I thought that was so great. But to say that our decisions are blocking him, no, he's completely accessible. We may be in and we may have distractions and temptations and all that kind of stuff, but he's always there, yeah. right? So it's not like, so let me ask you this. Is this like this mesh of corruption and destruction and, you know, thorns, and I can't get to Jesus because I, I all of these things that are in the way, what do you, what do you say to this? Is that actually how it's constructed? Well, there, there are things that are constructed to keep you, you know, f distracted, misdirected, um, developing different concepts and ideas of who, you know, who God is, who Jesus is, things. That, I mean, the, it's, it's massive. So the fact that that is true does not um, negate what is also true, which is all you have to do is, is what you just said. Father, will you teach me how to hear your voice? 
and it doesn't matter the garbage that's between you and him, his voice penetrates right through it, just like his voice penetrated through the dark. Yeah. Boom, right there. All you have, all, all Jesus is interested in is, are you interested in him? It's no more complicated than that. It's just that simple. So it's Jesus, like I'm interested in learning how to hear your voice. I don't have a clue how that's done. I'm not even going to define how to do it. I'm not going to condemn myself or criticize myself or do any such things. I'm not setting up any, any preconditions. I'm just going to say, teach me, and man, I'll be the best student you ever had. Yeah. And just leave it at that. And you'll say, good, let's do that. By the way, how many of us, when our babies come home to that same analogy, we say, okay, strap on the boots. You're going out and meeting the big bad world and all the stuff it throws at you. Yeah, go mow the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> None of us do that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, right. Jesus said, unless you're willing to come as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom. Wow. Why? Because you can't bring in your upside down thinking into his kingdom. They don't. They don't mesh. It yeah. doesn't work. You know, so the encouragement is, you know, and the, you know, the affirmation is, yeah, just just ask him it. He'll he'll penetrate through all that stuff. Like you a know, hot you knife know. through butter. Yep, it's exactly right. And what gets in the way today, he'll teach you how it works. So it won't get in your way tomorrow. And Amen. I think that's called growing. It's so big of an idea. And you, it's like, I've heard it before, but I haven't heard it this way before. <laughs> That's so amazing. You know what I love about you, Steve? You're not coming here saying, hey, here's the five steps in which you need to follow in order to get to Jesus. I think what's so pure about the representation is it's designed perfectly for you. Yep. And you're not, you're saying, I'm not the creator of this. No. I just know the one who is. No. And I love that. I love that about your your approach and all that. Because so much of what this world has done, and I think what you're saying is this idea of subjugating, yeah. that we've created these systems, right? We're the Methodists. And I love the Methodists, but there's a method to this. And it's like, well, do I have to follow your method? Well, it says, no, I, I'm not going to have to you know, worship in this place, in this mountain. I, it's, I do it in spirit and in truth. I listen to him. And I think that that's what's so interesting is it's everything seems like it's a middleman. But I think some intentions of people are like, well, some people need a guide. Some people need some help in understanding, well, what are we doing here? We're just exposing you to the conversation. But what is so refreshing about it is he's okay with whatever you ask. You, you want to have something else that'll blow your mind in this whole context? That's why we're talking, of course. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take this in two stages. The first stage I'm going to say is, remember, rem remember in our first um, stream, I think where we started was learning. We're trained to think situationally. Yep. We're situational thinkers. And what Jesus teaches us to do is to be strategic thinkers. And the reason for that is, is activity apart from strategy is merely busy work. And okay, so, so let's say that again. So let's say that again. Activity. Okay. Activity apart from, from strategic purpose is merely busy work. That's huge. Okay. Okay. And we're the busiest people on the planet. Right. Okay. Um, it's actually the repurposing of what Pharaoh did with you know, with um, the Israelites when he was confronted with Moses, tried to keep them super busy so they couldn't pay attention and yada, 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 right? Yep. And so we are, we are busy to the max, but what's really happening is, is we are tied to a pole, running our butts off in a circle, kicking up all kinds of dust, digging a very deep hole and thinking we're accomplishing something. Ooh. Because... We're situational in our thinking. When you're situational in your thinking, then circumstances begin to 
affect your decisions. And so you react to circumstances. And whenever you react, you are a second actor. And so you become follower of the first actor. Okay. So you unpack that a little bit. That's what's happened. So now let's think strategically here for just a second. You know, one of the reasons why the Jews rejected Jesus? Hmm. Because to them, he was a sinner. Now, what does, does the Christian theology say? He doesn't sin. He's perfect. He is without sin. Well, what's interesting is they don't tell you what sin is. Right. Give a, give a bunch of what do's and don'ts and this and that. There's a classification as a sinner, but there's no real what is it to sin. I probably asked, I can't even tell you the number of well-meaning Christian folks. I was one of them. Yeah. I remember when Jesus said to me, well, Steve, you want to talk about sin? What is, what is it to sin? What is sin? I could not answer him. I could give him a bunch of junk, but I could not answer him specifically. So one of the one of the problems with Jesus to the to the Jewish leaders was that he was not he didn't measure up to the standards of the Messiah as they had defined them. Yep. To them, the Messiah would conform precisely to their religious belief system. And Jesus didn't do any of that. Hey, you're healing this these guys on the on the side. What are you doing? You're breaking the law. Hey, your your disciples are stripping some of the grain off the edges of the field and eating. Man, in our law, under our the terms of our belief system, that's work on the Sabbath. Uh -huh. And Jesus says, "Hey, dudes." The Sabbath, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Yeah. Consequently, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, that blew their minds. Yeah. Well, whose authority are you speaking under? Well, Jesus says, I'll tell you what, you want to know the authority that I'm speaking under? Okay, answer this question and then I'll tell you. Is John, is the message that John speaks, is it from God or is it from man? Oh man, we better not talk about that because if we do, now their belief system is now starting to be exposed some. Yeah. Okay, now that's the, that's the belief system that that the religious leaders had then. Okay. Now, by the way, that same religious belief system still exists today. It's just repurposed. It has always been there. So now let's see how it would look. Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He goes to uh, Cana. His mother is, you know, part of a wedding feast. They run out of wine. She comes to him and says, hey, son, they're out of wine. Now, man, if you want to unpack that, the background to that and why she even came to him. Right, right. What that meant and the, his, and the backstory to all of that, man, that'll blow your mind. Yep. But then, so what is his answer to her? Woman, what does that have to do with me? It is not my time. I can't help. What did Jesus end up doing? Helping. Helping. What do we call that? Was Jesus telling the truth or was he telling a lie? Was he being deceptive? Was he being manipulated? What was he doing? Disciples come to him in John, I think it is John 7, and says, okay, um, Jesus, what you need to do, we need to boost your marketing campaign here. <laughs> We need to get this message out. We need to let people know who you are. So you need to go to the temple, you know, to the 
uh, temple tomorrow and make yourself known. And Jesus says, no, nah, that's not what I'm going to do. He said, uh, and then he says, makes this fascinating statement. He says, the world cannot hate you. But the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. Where did Jesus end up the next day? Temple. At the temple. Okay, okay. In the, con in the religious context, remember law we were talking about before? Under the standards of the law, what was Jesus doing? Was he misleading? Was he misdirecting? Was he lying? Was it, what was going on? Well, what I would suggest to you is that he was living his life and the, and the father tapped him on the shoulder and said, no, son, I need, I need you to do the deed for, for the groomsmen here. We need a little juice for the boys. I need, I need you to, to help out. Juice for the boys. Okay. Oh, okay, father, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Son, tap, tap, tap. Yep. Yeah, I, I appreciate the fact that you're not going to react to what those those people are doing, but I actually need you to be there tomorrow. Can you handle that? Father, let's do it. Yep. I want to do that. So why am I what am I describing here is the difference between the two kingdoms that we were talking about before. The one under the religious world is under law. You're sitting under law, and Jesus is not perfect. He's he's not perfect at all under the law under their law, because he is violating their law. So therefore, he's sinning according to their law. But just Jesus doesn't walk according to their law. He lives according, he lives according to the life that is, exists in the kingdom of God. And in that, in that domain, life is life. It flows. It's very fluid. Whatever it is that the and the, and the fundamental element is this desire, commitment, decree, like what you were making a couple of weeks, that no, I'm only going to listen to my father. He's the only one who has authority to speak to me. See? So if he says go, man, that's where I'm going. Yep. If he says do, that's what I'm going to do. If he says go, man, I'm gone. If he says accomplish this, man, that's what I'm working toward. And if I miss it along the way, my father is there to say, son, you got that off a little bit. Let's get you redirected on this thing. Why? Because he's relating to us based on our attitude to do nothing apart from him. Wow. He's not looking for precise execution. He's looking for a heart that is precise in its commitment to do nothing apart from him. Attitude. Now, why did I say all of that? All right, now let's go back to your, the, this is the method. Now let's think strategically. The planet is full of people in every generation who knows that there is a creator. And in them, they long to know that creator. And history is replete with all of these things, no matter the darkest corner of the planet, of people who are searching for their creator, to know their creator. Now, if you were the intruder who wanted to circumvent that, who wanted to parry that off and misdirect it in a different thing, what would you do? What strategy would you employ? See? Sometimes there's the strategy to deny that God even exists. We call them atheists. It's a term that has, that has a definition, but it doesn't have a term that has practical application. There's no such thing as an atheist. You know? So, okay, so what else do they do? There are very few that that buy into that concept. The overwhelming majority buy into some other concept. So what do you do? Well, I'm gonna to suggest to you that you create a religious con construct 
that ends up making people think that they're worshiping and serving God and finding him when in reality they're not. Hmm. They, become, they have aligned themselves to a model of conduct called a belief system, not align themselves with the real person whose name is Jesus. Well, in that um, having a form of godliness but denying its power? That's exactly what Paul is describing. That's how it works. And so because people are looking for, you know, looking for God, you can't, yeah, a very small minority will accept the premise, the belief system that he doesn't exist, but the overwhelming majority have to have an answer to that. So if you are the God of this world, whose name is Satan, you know, in that spiritual context, what would you do? Wouldn't you devise mechanisms that make those people think that they're actually finding and serving God, but in reality, they're not. They're finding and serving a belief system. Wow. Well, and this is the problem, right? This is, you're, you've hit it, the nail on the head. You know, this idea of being lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I mean, in a way, if you, if you recognize the fact that we're essentially been lied to or distracted and we're playing a game and the game, actually, you talked about having running around in a circle, digging a hole is in a way we've all been distracted by the one who is the distractor, right? I think a lot of times we think that the, the devil in the demonic realm is one of killing, but it's, you know, more subtle in many cases of being one of, you know, distracting you from the truth. And, it, and it's, it's a couple degrees off, but it does all the work that it needs to do. It makes you ineffective and also lies to you saying that you are a form of, of godliness, but it's not true. Well, it goes back to the, you know, activity apart from strategic purposes, merely busy work. Yeah. Yeah. So you step back and you say, what is the strategic purpose here? You know, what? Why is this so important? What? Why am I being forced to conform to a to a belief system in order to somehow gain relationship with the guy who created me? Yeah. I'm more interested in knowing why you created me than I am conforming to some standard of conduct. You know, Jesus, why did you create me? Yeah. Why did you do that? Well, and see, that's the the middleman issue here, yeah. is that in an effort to potentially explain, we've created these stumbling blocks or barriers in between, and that's why this is so refreshing, because you're saying, no, it's okay, you can go direct to the source. And it's so amazing how this structure is represented in crypto in a way, is that these pictures of decentralization, what do we sense is better? I'm not saying it's Jesus himself, but it's better than the centralized controlling system is one in which it's decentralized where you have choice. But as we centralize it, we take choice away. And what are all of these systems that man create? And no wonder people are like, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the church and you religious people. Well, yeah, me either. Because that is essentially this centralized controlling power that says, you, you, you can give over your choice to us. Sit down, shut up, and listen, and yeah. follow the rules. And that's the last thing Jesus did, sit down, shut up, and follow the rules. <laughs> well, what's fascinating to me is the, you know, we're back to our discussion many, many times before these channels about, you know, all devices are neutral. You know, the, the issue, and, and I'm, you know, there's a kind of a fine line, but it's to, it's to stress a point. Centralization of certain activities is, is valuable in its service to, to humankind because it can make things more efficient. Correct. So that greater benefit and use can be, can be um, extended to, to humankind, to the ones it's designed to serve. Where it gets in, where it transfers over is it becomes usurping to the, of the benefit that it, uh, the ones are trying to serve. So when it becomes usurping, then guess what? You have the wrong spirit going on there. Yeah. It's a spiritual issue, not a mechanical issue. Mechanical issues are improved 
with technology, skill, and expertise, right? But the but it doesn't matter how sophisticated the system gets if it's being operated by the wrong spirit. And by the way, conversely, it doesn't matter how inefficient the system is if it's being operated by the right spirit. See, I mean, let me tell you what, when all you had was a hoe, the technology was not all that great, but the ground still produced its 30, 60, 100 fold return. Yeah. See, and if the person, if, if the person operating that is doing it in the right spirit, in the right way, under the right leadership of the creator, guess what? That's going to bless and benefit not only them, but everyone that comes in contact with them. Well, that's the simplicity of the thinking that can be applied to the individual at the most basic fundamental level. Am I driven to exploit or am I driven to bless? Yeah. What spirit drives me? Hey, well, that's a simple question. Hey, well, if, if every time I come in, in contact with, with somebody and I'm trying to get a better deal on them and I want to get the big, the big slice of the, of the bologna and give them the little slice of the bologna, well, maybe I'll just rethink that. Because if that's what I'm doing to somebody else, guess who's trying to do that to me? Right. And, oh, by the way, there's this little concept. According to your standard measure, it's measured to you with increase. Well, dude, man, I, I don't. That's not what I want to produce. Now we're back to decisions. The decision I want to make is to learn to decide with you, Jesus, on every matter so that the harvest of my reality is produced out of that decision, not out of some decision that's trying to exploit, exploit me. Anyway. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I got something for you. I'm going to make a little, I'm going to shift gears on you here. Yeah. And push the clutch in and change gears. Um, Power shift. Yes. Here we go, folks. So I had an epiphany and it was a, it's, it's an illustration of all of this. I, I, I told you before my dad came to know the Lord when he was your age, <laughs> when he was, when he was 70, yeah, 71. And he tells a story. He told the story that, that the pastor brought in a cinder block and I don't even know the story, but to him it was so real. And so I had one of those experiences this morning and I want to tell you that story. And I want any commentary that comes to mind that you want to add to this. Okay. So this is really meaningful to me. And so in a way folks, I'm just modeling to you. And really this is what I do with Steve. I'm like, Steve, I thought about what you told me yesterday or what we talked about or what I read and here's what I'm seeing. And of course, that's good feedback for Steve. He's like, okay, but hang on, like, look at your language, what you're saying here. Let's twist this and understand. Hold on. What are we, what are we dealing with? So I'm going to do that again and I'm going to give you that commentary, but this is pretty cool. So my father, this is a, it's actually not the exact one, but I bought, it's the, the same model. This is a coffee pot that my father was given to by my birth mother. Um, right when he went into the service. And of course my dad drank so much coffee, self-medication with some, uh, you know, drank a ton of coffee. And so these old coffee pots are, are multiple warm. So there's a, a bottom reservoir and then there's a top reservoir in this top reservoir. There's a lid. And then inside this is a, a filter. Okay. And there's no paper filter or anything. It's just perforated holes. You put your coffee in there put your filter in, you pour hot water into it, you keep it warm and it drips into this, right? Pretty simple, very straightforward, uh, 1960s edition coffee pot. Okay. So I've I taken, recognize them. Do you recognize it? Okay. I do. <laughs> That when I look at that coffee pot, I see my dad. Cause every single day I would wake up to the sound of a, a tea kettle whistling at least on the weekends and it would whistle and that you knew and somebody had to run over to it because it would splash out of the because he filled it all the way up it would splash out onto the the um, stove and so you had to pour the hot water into the top of this thing 
And of course it would drain down and make your coffee, right? Rocket science, right? So last week we, um, we talked about this, this image and I want to, I want to revisit this. So this is kind of a big story here for me. We talked about this, um, idea of self and Jesus on the left-hand side is this reactive sense. And what, why I built this is because when you said to me, because I use the analogy that Jesus was like, an, uh, he was cutting through the ice of the mess. And you said, no, 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 no. Jesus is out front. He is strategic. He's out front. He's a shepherd. He's leading. We recognize his voice. The mess of the spilled coffee and the, the means by which our choices and our self is essentially the access by which, you know, all kinds of things enter into our life. There's a whole other side of this, which is this proactive listening and direction, because he's not leading from behind. He's leading from the front. And that was just tremendous for me. So this morning, you know, I have this coffee pot. I actually bought it on eBay because I wanted to remember my dad. And it came with all the parts, which my dad didn't have a lid and he had kind of a makeshift filter. But it's just every time I see it, I think of him. Well, this is the this is what came out of it. So I'm going to add this to the, um, I'm going to add this. So this is really meaningful to me and hopefully it has some meaning to you. So this is the coffee pot. This is the photo of it. Um, and these are the parts. And so what I want to, you know, share is that in this, in this creation of, let's say wonderful tasting coffee, um, you've got this reservoir at the top. Um, that you put a filter over the top of, and then you pour water. And the water goes through these holes, through your coffee into these holes, right? So it drips, drips through, and it gets to there. And then, of course, it ultimately ends up in the bottom. And, of course, you put a little top on it, and you kind of keep it warm. And, you know, hopefully you don't leave it on the stove too long because that can make your coffee taste like beep. All right. So here's the big thing that just wrecked me this morning, and I want to share with everybody. This right-hand side is me. This is us. On this side, you know, with this coffee pot, you know, we put all kinds of things into it ourselves. We have the choices. And to me, this side, this reservoir is a reservoir for a lot of different things. And we have this ability to essentially be a container for a lot of different things. I put all kinds of things into this coffee pot. But what I, what really just struck me and just stunned me this morning was this idea that this is a two-part system. When you, we have gone our own way, we add things, we fill things, and we act as a container of all kinds of things. We might add chicory. We may do all kinds of weird stuff in our coffee. But what ends up happening is it often and always ends up with the dregs at the bottom. And it ends up being just disgusting mess and like that, you know, spilled coffee, if you will. And so what I believe Jesus said to me in this whole thing is that this system is meant to be integrated. And if you actually look at, so we pull this out. If you actually look at this coffee pot, it's meant to be together, but it has its separation. And so I go my own way. I make my decisions. I do this stuff. I'm filled up with all these things. And, and Ray and I were talking this morning, and it was like, wow, I've been given so much ability of choice. I can do all kinds of things, but I'm limited. I can only fill this up. And boy, when I fill it up, I fill it up with the wrong stuff. And I know that the Lord is good, and he tastes good, and he makes the good stuff. And I'm like, hold on a second. I've been operating, and I think that out of this constantly in our lives, I get so frustrated because I'm, I'm not paying attention to this actually exists, right? So I'm going to put that aside. And so what do I do? All of the self-help stuff that I do, oh, I'm going to manifest it. Oh, I'm going to do this. And what ends up happening is I, I think about going into my house, and I just think of it as a husband. And let's say I'm frustrated with my wife, and I... I'm like, well, she's been criticizing me and saying, you're not doing what you should be doing. And, you know, she's upset with who I am. And she's reflecting back to me this disgusting person that I am. And I'm not, you know, doing the right things, pleasing the right. I'm just, I'm failing at this stuff. And so what do I do? I say, I'm going to manhandle it. I'm going to literally manhandle it. 
I'm going to go. And next time I go into the house, I'm going to just dance like a monkey. I'm going to go clean up the house. I'm going to go do this. But why am I doing it? I'm doing it because I want something. And I want to be like, okay, well, you need to change. You need to be different. You need to be better. Okay, well, I need to go and work out and I need to go read self-help and I need to do these things. And so what am I capable of doing? Well, I can fill this thing up. I can fill it up with all kinds of different things. But ultimately, it's kind of this work of my own hands. I do know that if I go and lift weights, I will probably improve my capability of lifting weight. I know that there's basic things that I could do. I've got diabetes. I know ways in which if what I eat is a problem and all those things. So I've been given choice to do those things. But when I saw this picture of the fact that what is this thing for? And I, I, I equate it to myself. Hold on. This thing is just a container. But when it's in its original form, what it was meant to do, it was actually meant to be a receptacle for something. And what is it a receptacle for? What is brewed up here? And so I think about this and I go, hold on. There is one who is above who fills not only with the source of the goodness, but also the water in which it steeps in. And inside it is poured. I do not pour it. And it drains through into and fills me. And in, in a way, you're saying, hold on. If I were to listen, and this is what I get from all of the stuff of talking to you, is if I listen to Jesus and I say, you know what, instead of me filling, instead of me manhandling it, instead of me saying I got it figured out, instead of me putting money into it or Lambos into it or whatever it may be, what if I were just to ask the one who created the coffee, the one who actually has this completeness, this doesn't do its purpose unless this is connected to this. This is what it was meant to do. It was meant to be a coffee pot. And to think that it's filled by, you know, what is it filled with and what does it produce? And then I think about, well, what is it meant to do? It's meant to pour out. And so when I had this experience this morning, I'm like, hold on a second. I want my wife to love me and respond to me. I want people to like me. I want whatever it is that I want in life. I think, and I've been taught in this upside down world that I got to go out and get it. I got to go manhandle it. And the truth is, I have to stop and say, I only do what you tell me to do. And what is amazing about this and my, you know, what just dropped me today, this morning on all of this, is that who are you meant to be? You are meant to be connected to the source of me and to do what I ask you to do because you were created specifically for a purpose. But when you're aligned with me and you're connected to the vine and you are drawing from the right stuff, you literally pour out of yourself this endless representation of me, which is this blessing. And it completes the picture of who you were created to be. And I realize I am been separated this whole time, and the world is telling me, fill yourself up with these man-made things, and you will get, well, yeah, a little bit of benefit. Is there something in the container? Yeah, sure, there's something in the container, but it always passes away, Steve. I'm like, well, if I just get more money, that's how everybody d decides what the scorecard is. But then my family's a shambles, or I go out and I try to get successful things. And what does the world tell me is successful? I need five Lombardi trophies, Steve, but I'm still not. I still don't have peace in my life. And if I had the right relationships, or, and then I get to the point where I've literally lost myself, and I'm like, I'm just going to numb myself. I'm just going to drink. I'm just going to do drugs because I cannot manage this thing unless I've got something that takes the damn edge off. Yeah. And what you have said to me and what I know to be true and what I've experienced and tasting of the brisket, if you will, that the Lord is good, is that if I can stay connected to him, what is that? Without me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine and you're the branches. All we have to do, this isn't about salvation. This isn't about fire insurance from hell. 
This is about fulfilling the purpose in which you were created to be. And he has been essentially yelling at us. And I mean that very nicely yeah. of story upon story upon story upon story. And when you read the Bible in that context, what do you see? You know what I see? Technicolor of one who speaks and those who follow. And those who follow have tremendous things happen that are strategically decided in advance for you to do. And if you align yourself and don't go your own way, you literally plug yourself into and become the thing you were meant to be, he will cover you and keep you warm. Yeah. And I know that that's like kind of horsey analogy of a coffee maker. But for me, it was, wow, the implications of this is, so when I do go home and my wife's mad at me and I think, well, I just need to perform. That's actually her leading me. She's over top of me going, get it together, guy. You need to like change your behavior. And so this, the, the order of things gets out and my wife is leading me. And I go, no, what does she want? What would make me more attractive to my wife? What would make me be the person following him and having him be the source of that? So that out of the source that is given to me, I do things that he says. And guess what? I still do the dishes and I still clean the floor and I still do the things, but I'm not doing them because I'm obligated to doing those. I do those because in the proper order of things, he's in charge of me. And out of that blessing comes an attractiveness to my wife that is greater than any attractiveness because w women can identify and it's, this is one example. They can smell fear, and they know when you are not leading, when you are reacting and responding. And there is one whose headship over us, Jesus himself says, I make it easy for you to listen. If you listen to me and follow me, all things around you will be ordered, and all things will be blessed, and your cup will run over, and you will have peace. But I do not... I do not judge how the world judges. Yeah, right on. Thoughts. That's my drama. That's my <laughs> performance art for the day. Well, I mean, I mean, this is this is what Jesus does. <laughs> I mean, you, there was a point he wanted to make with you, and he used a coffee pot. And the impact of the of the story is not the coffee pot; it's the impact on you. Yeah, I mean, your communication is more about what is unseen in the in the illustration than what is seen in the illustration. The, the, what is seen in the illustration is just the window that's opened up that says, "Look what God is doing on the inside of that through this little thing." He's blowing Matt's mind. Yeah. You know, by the way, he's doing the same thing for the rest of us. OMG, you're pouring stuff into us so that we can then be used to pour you out to others. Oh, that's it. Say that again, Whoa. please. Say that again, please. He's pouring in. Pour, Father, you are pouring stuff into us so that we can then pour out of us who you are. Well, through a coffee pot. That's it. Who can come up with that stuff? I don't. And, and, the, and the fact that it's so representative of my father. Yeah. You know, I and I think that's so, it, it means so much to me because it's literally him. Like I literally, as a kid, every single weekend, right? I mean, he hit the, hit the top of that. And what's so neat about this too is the mystery too of it's almost like, and Steve, push back on this if this is wrong. It seems like everything then is spiritual as well as physical. Everything is. Yeah. And that even these many things that you don't think are decisions actually can and do add up. Is that true? Like everything actually is spiritual and physical at the same time? These two sides of the coin exist simultaneously? Well, absolutely. And you know that's true because of the strategic effort that has been made to separate them. Yeah. 
See, one of the ways you know what's actually there is by seeing how something is attempted to be manipulated or described. There is an intense effort to separate and compartmentalize the spiritual and the material. Yeah. Well, why? Because they're not separate. They're two parts of the same whole. And man... The creation of man is the only being in God's creation that operates in both dimensions at the same time. Well, why is that so? Because the creator who operates in, in both dimensions also who, who resides, you know, in the other dimension wants to partner with us to bring heaven to earth. Isn't that what it is? As in heaven, so also in the earth. Well, how does heaven operate? You know, the creator tells us how to live and we say, I want to live that way. Well, okay, let's do that on earth. What do you think? Yeah. You know, as parents, even though we, it may be our first go around, we are a healthy parent does not try to over control the child so that they turn the child into a slave or a robot. You know, a healthy parent, give, you know, gives guidance and framework for the child to then experience what it is to be alive and to live and then make sure there are boundaries and rails in place so that they don't end up running off a cliff. Well, why is that? Because they don't know how to live yet. They're just learning how to live. They're just learning what it is to, you know, to live. And so part of what we're doing is trying to equip them and train them, prepare them for when they'll be out there by themselves. Huh. See? We don't know how to live with God. So what does he do? He teaches us how to live with him. How does he do that? Through little illustrations like he just gave you. Yeah. Matt, this is bigger than a coffee pot, but let me tell you what. It'll blow your mind once you get it. Whoa, no truer words were ever spoken. My mind is blown. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting is I've heard this many times and it resonates with me. You know, it starts in a, it starts in a garden and it finishes in a city, right? You see this idea of it coming down that there's growth and there's trajectory and there's momentum and there's strategic, you know, the, the, the shepherds out front. Right. And he's doing something and has done it. And when you take it in in its entirety, it's, it's so God has so much grace and patience with us. Yeah. It's amazing. And it, even, even as generations pass, you know, he's so patient with us and we're, and that's what is just so amazing to me is that here I, we stand on the footsteps or, or the, the doorstep of the pulse chain. Okay. So if I can bring this all back around to crypto in a way, you know, I start this channel almost two years ago, right? Or 18 months ago. And why do I do it? Right. I do it because, Hey, I'd like to pump my own bags. Right. I'd love to, I like, I got into pulse and pulse X and you know, and I, I wanted to do this, but also I was listening to, to Jesus in this process going, Hey, I know this is more than, more than just that. Well, what is it? And then what I got to see was there's a bunch of dudes and I'm like, every dude that I meet in this hex and pulse world, these are the guys that don't step into church and I love it. I like have such a heart for people because I was that same guy. I'm like, I, I still am not a super fan of going to church, to be completely honest with you. And now that I see it for what it is, I go, yeah, it has a place. And but that's not the point. The point is knowing the one who created it all. And so what is amazing to me is that he's going to accomplish his purposes regardless of what we do. And I think that that's the thing you talk about. What's he doing? And are you? Are you in line with what he's doing? Are you coming into that? Well, some of this is, it almost feels like a lot of people feel my, my life wasn't meant for obscurity. Like I was meant to do something. Like I was meant to have purpose and I was meant to have, you know, some impact and make a difference and leave a legacy and have some grandkids and called, be called Papa or whatever it is. Like there is a, there's something more to this than I've been presented with. And 
I look at this crypto thing and I look at what's happening in the world and I look at it as a gift on one hand, but also a tool on the other. And when you say you can animate tools, right? You can animate tools for good. What an interesting time, Steve. I mean, if you really boil this down, this is the first time in human history where financial power and military power or political power has been separated. It used to be you'd win a war, you'd kill the people, you'd take their gold, and you'd rewrite the rules. And there's story after story after story of people just destroying other people and taking their stuff. And that's because the money was tied to the political and military might. And this is the first time where there's this peaceful revolution that happens where the resources which are required meet with this idea of decentralization, but in and of itself, it's just a tool. And if it were animated with this idea of what if we considered others in addition to ourselves? And what if we actually were listening to the one who created it all? Is he potentially in this time and in this era drawing up a, people, a group of people who would say, I'm only going to do what he tells me to do, and I'm going to fulfill the purpose that I was created for, and I'm going to animate the tools that are around me to let the kingdom come and be a part of that kingdom building. And what is that kingdom building? It's a blessing for even the person who curses it. Yeah. And that's what I love about it. It's like, you might not like Christians, but you'd like me to be one. (laughs) <laughs> right? I mean, you want me to be kind and gentle and caring and thoughtful of you. You want me to consider you in addition to, to myself, but that's the beauty of it. It's like, no, this is custom tailored for you. And I look at this and I go, why do you know about this stuff when you know about it? And then I look at the macro and I say, what is Jesus doing in the world? And how is he planning to use us? And then I think about these streams and I go, Steve, God has used you in my life to give me, to remind me of who I am in him and to to step out and to rule, not on my own, but only doing what he asked me to do. And every time that that happens, everyone is blessed. There's so much impact around that. And it's almost like, you know, that idea of loving your enemies, like heaping hot coals on their heads. It's like, no, 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 I, I got this. I got this. I'm ahead of you. And it makes you like exhale and rest in it. And you go, hold on a second. So you're actually fighting the battle. You're actually doing the work, but you're saying, hey, we can we can be a part of that with you. And in fact, I planned this all since the beginning. Yeah. Do you think people miss out? You know, you talks about the seed that lands on the path and some of it gets choked out and some of it doesn't grow and all that kind of stuff. Do you think there are those who really have missed out on what the fullness of the life could have been had it not been for for this drowning out in distraction? Well, yes, they do. Um, But remember, that's in the context of a very minute portion of the whole life experience. And, you know, we are eternal in our in our nature. So um, Jesus had me send out this this email um, during the Trump period early on. And essentially it was saying, hey, listen, you're not fighting against the people you think you're fighting against. Who you think is your enemy is not your enemy. Um, I encourage you to realign your focus so that you can get in the real game. And then some folks had it asked me to explain about that. Um, and so Jesus said, Hey, elaborate on this a little bit. And there was this one of these concepts, okay, that speaks, you know, to your question. And it was if you hold to the traditional Christian view that um, that the creation is is approaching 7,000 years. 6,000 years old, you know, for sure, approaching 7,000 years, whatever that looks like. Then based on that model, 
a human, a human being who lives to be 75 or 80 years old, who has, you know, 60 at most 70 years of adult participation on the planet. That means they have an equivalent of participating in the Lord's plan as an eight month old child. Yeah. So in the, in the scope of his plan, if the, if the planet is seven years old, an adult only participates to the equivalent of an eight month old. Well, that's not a lot of time. No. That's not a lot of time to participate. You know, wow. so when you, you got, you just got it, didn't you? Oh man. Okay. Like a ton of, like a ton of bricks. Okay. So here's what happens. So yeah, there are a lot of people who, because of the spiritual conflict that is going on and the incarceration that has occurred of mankind for the majority of those 7,000 years, there are a lot of people who have missed out because they have been brutally treated in their lives. We can look all around the planet to see those examples. Never hearing anything about God, never hearing anything about Jesus, knowing that there is a creator out there, not really knowing how to engage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there are those who have chosen, on the other hand, not to take advantage of what life has to offer them. But the point of that is that is a span of an eight-month-old. Yeah. So what does Jesus do? Well, Christianity, ha Christianity has this dilemma because it says, you know, unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and confess him as Lord and Savior, you know, you're going to hell. And then the question comes up, well, what about those people who have never heard yeah. the name of Jesus? What about those folks? Well, you know, who can answer? That's just the way it is. The reason is because the belief system is not designed to provide an answer. It's designed to provide acceptance and compliance to the belief system. But if you ask Jesus what that is, okay, Jesus, hey, that's a fair question. What does happen with all those folks? And he'll tell you, well, when they stand before me, then what is in them regarding me will be known instantaneously. And they will either bow out of adoration and respect because they recognize the majesty that is before them or they will bow out of compliance out of the sheer weight of that same majesty. So it doesn't matter what happened on the planet over the scope of eternity. What, what matters is what happens in that moment when they meet me. That's what happens. That's what is important. And that is what will declare their choice regarding me in that moment. Wow. So well, look at the, look at the thief. They on the... For eight months. Yeah. Right. They will glory with me for an eternity. Well, look at the thief on the cross, right? There's two thieves on the cross. I love to me. That is the greatest hope. Yep. Here's this one who is being sentenced to death as a thief next to Jesus. And he says today, yeah. You will be with me in paradise. Yeah. And it, that, that to me, like encompasses the whole thing. That's but what it. I, what blew my mind though. Uh, so it, this is somewhat complex, I guess. I think about Methuselah, right? I think pre flood Enoch, Noah, all these people. And then you even see uh, Sarah and Abraham, right? I can't have a kid at this age. What are you talking about? I'm a geezer. Well, yeah. My knees aren't so good. <laughs> But you think about there was a time prior to this where it's documented that people lived longer. Well, if you think about what is in the world, and I mean, after we left the flaming swords and were pushed out of the garden, there was a time when how I mean, 
what did Noah live for? I mean, some of them lived 900 years, some of them 365 years. Well, I've never really thought about it this way, but it's so big. It says after the flood that you'd get at maximum 120 years, right? That's yeah. kind of what I, I read it to be. Yeah. And it seems so limited. And then you talk about this eight months, you know, like this, what is that in the context of it? What's amazing about this is um, a shortened life is actually the grace of God. Yes. That is so profound, Steve. Yes. To think that our reduction in the length of our life and how many people are grasping onto this and they're like, because of their belief system, yeah. They go, this is the best it's going to get. I better get mine now because I'm just the descendant of a monkey that over thousands of years, you know, things have banged against each other and poof, here you are. But when you actually read and understand the context of what has been screaming at us, and that's a wonderful thing, you know, why I have reverence for the scriptures themselves is because what's funny about it is it's almost telling the same story over and over and over and over again. You, <laughs> dumb, really you, yeah. you dummy, like yeah. you need to get it. And, and I think prior to the printing press, when people didn't have the book, well, no wonder they had to be told these stories. And no wonder Jesus came and said, hey, even if you look at a woman, like he redefined the very nature of the corruption in our hearts and this need for him. <sighs> But to think that our short life, so that, and then I, I think about my dad, David Lees comes in seven and a half hours. I'm staring at my dad in the casket and I can see a picture of it in my mind right now. And I just thought about all the things that, you know, I had planned that are not possible. Yeah. And then this hope that you go, what is the hope in all this? But what I loved about what you said, and I think that this is the thing that you don't, you don't hear, you hear a lot of turn and burn, right? Yeah. Turn or burn. Right. And what you just said, I think, is really significant. And it's illustrated on the cross with the thief is like, no, today you'll be with me in paradise. OK. So he also said every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And you said it's either out of adoration or it's out of obligation, which I think is so tremendous. This idea of what are you going to do with me? Well, once you're in the presence of holiness and it's like. No wonder he said it is finished. Yes. No wonder he said it is finished. He didn't say it's a, it's kind of finished. And Steve, you're going to have to go through these horsey rules that the church has set up so that maybe then you might be able to make it through if the pastor gets the notch on his belt just right. It's all that stuff falls away. And you're like, no, this is in in, in a way what joy it has and what what blessing it is to endure if we know that our endurance, whether it be in plenty or in want or in struggle or in torture, that apart from him is much, much worse than being connected to him. And then when you find yourself connected and led to that and asking of those things, it doesn't become about this conversation that will happen when you meet him face to face. It's about what's the work to do today. Yeah. How amazing is it? Yeah. And now you think, well, now my life's got purpose. I shouldn't fear at all. I, I should I should go forward in this. Well, then the question is, what's he about to do? <laughs> well, that is exactly right. I mean, and man, this is this whole part of the discussion is a continuation of our earlier comments about attitude. Yeah. See how attitudes are changing? Yeah. It's it. They're now being changed from upside down to right side up from panic. Oh, wow, maybe. No, Jesus is not the slightest bit insecure about where he is and what he's doing and the certainty of his deal being accomplished. There's not an ounce of uncertainty. It just is. Yeah. So, OK, I want to hang with the guy who just is. Wow. That's what I want to do. I mean, there's all kinds of directions we, you know, we could go and, you know, in, in this line of, of conversation, but the, but the essence of it is he just is. And so why wouldn't we just do that? Yeah. 
just hang with him. Let's just do that. Knowledge right off the bat. Don't have a, don't have a clue how to do that. So let, just made it matter of record. I have no flipping clue what I'm doing. Yes. So Jesus, now that we got that straight, not for your benefit, but for mine. Yep. See, okay. Now where do we go from here? How do we do this? How do what we an, actually learn to live this way? And what an adventure it is. Yes. I mean, what an adventure. Oh, the places you will go. Yeah. Can I tell you a little story? You know, yeah, please. It's perfect it, timing. It, it illustrates this because, you know, part of part of what we are we are taught is a, an escapism. Yeah. That if we hang with Jesus, we're going to escape all of the all of the bad stuff. Yeah. Well, no, it's because you don't understand what the bad stuff is about. See, the bad stuff is going to make you better. It's going to teach you how to rule with me if you change your attitude and get aligned with me. I'll teach you how to relate to this stuff in the appropriate way. Now, here's a simple example. I'm 10 years old. I'm playing Little League. And in those days, little 10-year-olds didn't get a chance to um, play in the regular games with the 11 and 12-year-olds. So we had the 10-year-old games were every Friday night. And so we'd have our Friday night games. Now, the exception to that was the last game of the season where all the 10-year-olds could play with the 11 and 12-year-olds. So that was a big deal. Yep. Right? So we get this. So I'm a 10-year-old. I'm playing against 10-year-old pitchers and, you know, I'm doing the I'm doing my thing. I'm much better. I don't even know I can play, but I'm playing really well, much better than anybody else because I just had those raw physical abilities that were inherent and most none of the other guys had that very few. So, I'm now playing against the 12-year-olds. So, I go up to the plate and I'm facing this 12-year-old pitcher and he throws a fastball and I don't even see it. <laughs> Whoa, that was really fast. So I get up there and he throws another one and I foul it off and it's now 0-2. And, and so I'm up there ready to go and he throws me a curveball and I can see that curveball in my mind's eye like it happened 15 minutes ago. And it goes and it drops right off the table. Shoot, boom. And I look at that thing. I'm going, what was that? I walk back to the dugout and all of, you know, the, the crowd is sitting in the bleachers right behind it. And I look at this woman eyeball to eyeball and I said, what was that? I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. The dude just plain struck me out, overmatched me. I was done. If I would have accepted that at that moment, that experience as being the totality of experience, I would have never played another game of baseball yep. because I would have seen myself as incapable of dealing with the skill that was being ex exercised against me. Now I'm using adult vocabulary, vocabulary. Didn't think like that as a kid. I'd just been too scared is how I would have described it as a kid. I'm too scared. No, but the attitude was, no, man, I, wow, I got to learn how to hit that. So the, the superior competitive skill that was being exercised against me eventually got me to the place because I was not afraid of it eventually got me to the place where I could hit Frank Tanana's curveball. <laughs> That's a curveball. I could hit Nolan Ryan's curveball. I could hit Ron Guidry's slider. Why? Because what was this set out there to destroy me, I looked at it differently and used it to make me better than it. That's the right side. That's an example of the right side up attitude. So it's not about escaping what is coming at me. It is about con 
taking that which is coming at me and saying, okay, show me again, because the more times you show me that, the better I'm going to get at beating you. So keep showing me. Keep doing it. You want to keep doing that? Okay, let's continue to play. Let's play. That's the attitude that happens inside the kingdom of God. Do you think Jesus looked at all of this stuff that when they tried to run him off the cliff, what did he do? He finally said, okay, you've had your time. We're stopping. And what did he do? He passed right through it. See? The, the competitive, the superior competition that's coming against us is not against us. It is for us if we learn how to view it. Now, that doesn't mean you become a masochist. It just means you no longer run from it. Why? Because the guy who you're hanging with just is. Wow. Hey, that's the, rea that's the reality I want to live in. The reality that is. And what's coming at me is not what is. That's about to be beaten. See? Because wow. yeah. it's making me better. Yep. See? That, that switch that happens in you, and you can't force it, it just eventually one day occurs. It doesn't mean that you're a masochist and you love all the pain and you bite all the problems. No, Jesus actually said to, hey, uh, let's keep this temptation stuff, this nonsense stuff at a distance. Okay, Father, let's do that. Father says, fine, until it's time for it to make you better. Okay. Wow, okay. Well, and it gives you such confidence. And, you know, you're like, I'm hanging, with, money. Yeah. I'm, I'm hanging with the guy, you know, who knows the answer. Wow. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny is we see the account of the disciples going, hey, do you want us to smite that guy? Yeah. And they had confidence in knowing that they could. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. Yeah. And I, I just think about that idea that <clears throat> bring it on, bring it on. Not that you're a masochist. I, I think that's a really good warning and all of that stuff. But in a way. But you could apply that to the world. You could apply that to, you know, there's this infinite resolution. I talk about the coffee pot, but then there, there also applies to world leaders. And, you know, once you start seeing these things for what they are upside down, you realize this is all a derivative of the same heart issue and problem. It's we're seeing these things incorrectly. And that's what is really interesting to me is that if there is this forward progress, because you know, a lot of people, and I think we should probably finish with this, there's a lot of people who are like, they kind of imagine that, well, they said, this is not our home, and we're just going to get jettisoned off this place, and, you know, you know, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to come on the clouds and kick everybody's butt, and we're just going to get jettisoned to heaven, and I'll be with my harp singing with all my Baptist friends with a diaper on like a cherub. And it seems like, well, I don't have to do anything. I don't have any responsibility for this kingdom stuff because I got a one way ticket off this place. And what I hear from all of the stuff that that you have to be cautious, that is not true. What would you say to people who are thinking that, you know, I read Ecclesiastes and I hear Solomon say, it's all meaningless, like chasing after the wind and it, certain times, Steve, I agree with him. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like the stuff repeats and it's like chasing after you can't put your hand on it. But then when you start listening to Jesus and he actually gives you specific things and then you see the fruit of it. And that's what I want to say to people. None of what we've talked about for the last six sessions have been about you need to follow this thing or that thing, or you need to be, you know, join this thing or, you know, go to church more. That's the last thing that we're trying to tell you. Is worse, but I think what is so big about this is it because it's so custom tailored for us. It reminds me that you were created for a reason, and that there is actually stuff for you to do if you're willing to go along with it. It's like he cut us in on the deal, man. And it's like, no, this is cool. And and I think he's also excited. Hey, you get this? Yeah, you with me? Okay, let's do some great things together. And that's when I think a grandkid's going, hey, hey, Papa, let's go play catch in the yard. 
and you're like, I get to play catch with a professional baseball player. <laughs> you know, my my papa is a is a you know the mustachioed man. You know how cool is that? Like that to me, it's like it, that's why he's a father. It's it's amazing. What do you say to people though that are like, yeah, I'm just enduring this until you know I get I get my jetpack ejector seat off of this place? Yeah, yeah, great question, Matt. Um, first of all, we're not looking for trouble, <laughs> but trouble is coming. See, it comes every day. Jesus Himself said it, right? Every day has enough trouble of its own. So it's not that you're looking for trouble; it's that you know it's coming, and when it comes, you're ready for it. Yeah. Meaning you're not going to you're not going to shy away from it. So what does that have to do now with the with the next question about you know what what some people have affectionately called their you know their life insurance or fire insurance fire insurance yeah fire insurance is that 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 there's a tragedy that's wrapped up inside of that. Um. And the strategic purpose to it is, is to get people to discount the value of the planet and the life that we live on the planet, to render it meaningless. That's the strategic purpose behind that way of thinking. Now, why is that then tragic? Because that way of thinking, what it does is it, is it hides the reality of what is occurring in the divine. Okay, now I'm going to take just a second to describe this. By the way, once again, I'm going to say this that I've said in other streams. What I'm, what I, these things that I share with you, I didn't come up with this stuff. You know, I didn't study and do all kinds of stuff and say, oh, this is my conclusion about that. No, this is all stuff that Jesus taught me that I, my brain was not even remotely capable of conceiving or concluding. And here's, and here's part of that, an example of that. The test of the divine is the ability to decree and then accomplish your decree without deviation. That's the test of the divine. Say it one more time. The test of the divine is the ability to decree and then enforce and accomplish that decree without deviation. Now think about that for a second. I have certain sovereign capabilities of decreeing certain things within my, but they're very, very limited. And I know where, they're, where the limitations are because I can't enforce them or even accomplish them. Now, sometimes I can, but I'm not, the reason I know I'm not divine is because that doesn't happen every time I do it. It operates within a very narrow framework. Okay. Now, why is that important? Because the father who is divine, the one out of whom all things have come and out of whom all things exist. He decreed that man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. That was his vision. His decree for the planet, for planet Earth, was that his man would rule the Earth with him in his likeness and image. In other words, in his, the fullness of his nature and character. So the first Adam, what he did is he ruled for a period of time, but then what he did is he transferred that authority over to the serpent, who was the agent of Satan himself, who actually did what you were describing earlier, which is coming in, taking over, and through, for, through mechanism of force, taking over and stealing all the, the resources of that place. Well, that's why we have the wars today that you described. That's where it started. And it's just been a repurposing of that same dynamic. So why is this fire insurance difficult? Because what it says is it renders the earth and man's role in it as meaningless. Hmm. And what is his role in it? To rule the earth with God 
in the fullness of his nature and character. So when you render it meaningless, you render the decree meaningless and you are actually speaking against it being accomplished. So in the name of going to your place of reward, you are actually being manipulated into using your own sovereign ability to decree its demise. Wow. That's the strategy that we are in the middle of, that we have no clue of because we're taught to run around the pole and be really busy. Yep. Wow. And there's so many illustrations of that too. If you guys, you know, one thing that just strikes me is we, you talked, I don't know how many episodes ago you talked about Lydia and you talked about them going to Macedonia and you talked about the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of God, right? Like this delineation. Yeah. Yeah. And how they were basically told to do something and this distraction, even as subtle as it was to declare who they were. So it, 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 that's, that's amazing. And I know that's kind of inside baseball. Um, Steve, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. And I think about, I often ask the question, Hey, what's our role? You know, stay in your lane, bro. Like what's yeah. your role? Right. And I think about, you know, I meet you and you've been writing all this stuff and you've been asking Jesus these things and you're, you know, I meet you in a way that was like divinely appointed where God just says, Hey, listen to this guy. And so I start doing this. And what's amazing to me is that almost, I feel like you've given me permission and it's not that it's required from you. Right. I, I recognize that, but it's almost like, well, this is an encouragement to me. And, and I think to so many other people who are going to find themselves in abundance. And of course, we find ourselves in abundance now. I mean, look around. But also there's something about these resources and tools to say, you know, what I love about generosity, and this is from a, a purely kind of, I don't know, flesh perspective, is that it's, it can't be mandated. The idea of generosity is actually something that um, if somebody tells you to be generous, it ceases to be generosity because it's yeah. a choice that you make, right? Whether it be compassion or, or generosity or whatever. But you know what's really interesting is a lot of the times in my past when I've really felt like Jesus spoke to me, rather than me saying, this is the time I've allocated for you to speak to me, right? <laughs> like I'm setting this apart as this is the time. It wasn't, it wasn't like scheduled. It wasn't on my calendar. But yeah. he basically... You know what was interesting? So many of those things were about what I was to give. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. really interesting. Or what I was to let go of. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. It's just an observation about this idea. The times I've heard from him is like, I need you to do something. I need you to give. And I, I remember. So let me tell you the story. We'll wrap up with this one. So it was really, really hot in Dallas. And then when I mean hot, like 108. And I was a single guy, I'd been living downtown Dallas, and I was going to this church. And I loved the church. And it was just, it was a time I was like super excited about everything that God was doing. And I'm driving, I want to say, yeah, it was a Sunday afternoon after church. And I'm driving down I-75 South towards my apartment. And the Lord says, or no, I, I, and I'm driving past the Tom Thumb which the Tom Thumb is a uh, grocery store. And there's a woman who's a mom with a sign and it has like a paragraph on it. It's not like we'll work for food. It's like a paragraph and you can't really read it. And there are three small kids up underneath a crepe myrtle tree in the shade, three kids. And so when I was looking at the situation while I was driving past, I'm like, this is highly unusual. Usually if somebody's, you know, kind of vagrant, they're like out there just trying to, you know, get a buck or something. This was different. And I'm like, what's going on? Well, she was a mom. And come to find out what was on her sign was the explanation that her transmission went out on her car and she couldn't get to work or take her mom to the doctor. And she wasn't like exploiting the kids by putting them out. The kids were just like, we got to stick out of the way in the shade. It's 108. <laughs> And so this is Sunday afternoon after church. And so I get on the highway to go south. And the Lord says, turn around. 
Mm. And I'm like, I don't want to turn around. He's like, no, get off now. And I'm like, okay, fine. I guess I got nothing better to do. So I get off the highway and I'm like, and I'm literally having this conversation. I don't, what am I going to do? This is a woman and this, some dude's going to come up and talk to her. Like, what am I going to say? So I'm having this discussion with, with him going, I don't know what to do. And he's like, no, go over there. So I park in the Tom Thumb parking lot and I'm literally, I get out of the car and as if I'm talking to someone else. I'm like, what am I going to say? Yeah. And she, and, and he's like, I'll tell you what to say. I'm like, okay. So I walk across to this lady and I said, Hey, how are you doing? And she's like, Oh, you know, and she told me this story. And I said, has anyone given you anything? And she said, no, but somebody gave me this and she shows the bottom of our church's newsletter or the, the right. And it was, it's funny because I was going to this church and they had torn off the bottom of their bulletin and just rolled down the window just a little bit and slipped this thing out to her and said to her, our church helps people like you. Okay. That's the only thing that happened. And here I am standing in front of her and literally over her shoulder, there's a church right behind the Tom Thumb. There's a church right there. And I said, so no one's helped you out. No one's done this stuff. And she, and I saw it as a sign that, Hey, this person put this church. That's my church. And we help people like you. So I said, here's my number. We're going to help you. Well, I had been serving in the church. I was known in the church. I was a leader in a certain ministry in the church. And Steve, I went into the church and I turned myself inside out to help that woman. And they put up barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier to help that woman. Yeah. And she she responded and she came there and they wanted her to go through counseling and they wanted her to hop on one leg and they wanted her to do all these things. And I'm like, you said you helped people like this. Yeah. And you know what? That was a moment in my life where I recognized, one, Jesus will tell you what to do. But two, the systems that's been set up is not effective in its service of others. And I literally, that was just a moment for me that I just basically said, all right, if I'm going to do something, I got to do it. Like I got to do it myself. I can't rely on the system that's been placed because they'll put all kinds of barriers. And it was really sad. But it illustrated two huge things. One, even when you're not expecting it, he could speak directly to you. And he punched right through the veil and said, hey, this is what we're doing right now. The fruit of it, though, I've had story after story, and you've got many more stories than I have. I just want to say to folks that are, might be watching this, it, do you want the greatest adventure of your life? Well, it's not about what you acquire or accrue. It's not about the size of your bank account. If you want to have an experience that reminds you constantly that you fought the lion and the bear, that everything in your life is redeemed for the purposes that he has, and that you really see that he's planned these out in advance for you to do. And there's joy and there's peace and it's overwhelming and you weep and you become addicted to this idea that you're not alone. We're not alone. No. And I feel alone. I, after my dad passed, Steve, I felt very alone. And Until it's so, David showed up. What's that? Until David showed up. That's right. Until David <laughs> Lee showed up and gave me the hug. Now it's just a reminder of it all. So, Steve, thank you so much for once again. Six weeks, man. We got 12 hours into this thing. Fantastic. Fantastic. I appreciate you so much, and it is super fun. Um, I'll catch you in the green room here, and we'll we'll sign off. Good deal. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thank Have you, a Steve. great weekend. All right. Once again, God sees you out the corner of his eye. By the way, that's a reference from The Count of Monte Cristo, my favorite movie. Folks, this is a blessing to me, and I just never imagined that it would be like this, but it's so cool to be able to have this conversation because I don't see this conversation happening anywhere on YouTube. I hope that it's something that encourages you, but I just want to remind you of the overarching thing. I'm on a journey myself personally, and Steve has been really helpful to, to point me in a direction, and I think really, I think God is using him, certainly using him, to help me understand what the true gospel is. 
And one of the things that I, I just think about it, somebody said the gospel is good news. Well, if it's not good news for everyone, it's not good news. And I look at the purity of this. Jesus is alive and he speaks. He's accessible to you and there are no middlemen. Try him on for size. This is the greatest journey of all. But I'm not asking you to pray some prayer or to hop on one foot or whatever it is. That's not what this is. Um, because it's um, it's real and it's true. And that's why I'm doing all this stuff. But I'm seeing in this process, it's like a great movie. One man looking to pump his bags in Pulse Chain and Pulse X goes to find and get the money in the Lambo. In reality, God brings a man who tells him it's not about the Lambo. It, every story that we love is about someone who wants something so bad and in the process of going to get it, they discover something greater. That is the story because every story is about one who came to pay the price and save us all. I just encourage you to listen to him because he's available. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt. Pulse chain's coming, folks. Do not mess with Texas. Take care.